For those who are interested, there is one continuing education contact hour available for this webinar for a fee of $30. And if you wish to obtain credit, please register again at coeh.berkeley.edu and then complete the evaluation for the webinar. You'll then be emailed your certificate of completion. After today, the webinar will be archived and we'll provide a link to those who have attended today. Um, it's also being live streamed on Facebook. And so you'd be able to view the recording there as well. So at this time, I'm very pleased to welcome our presenter today. He is the director of this Northern California COEH, Dr. John Barnes. He's also director of the UC Berkeley UCSF Joint Medical Program. He's a professor of environmental health sciences at the UC Berkeley School of Public Health and a professor of occupational environmental medicine at UC San Francisco. His research includes a study of respiratory health effects of various air pollutants. And in 2007, he was appointed by the governor as physician member of the California Air Resources Board, which is the primary state agency responsible for action to protect public health from air pollution. So on behalf of everyone at COEH, I'm extremely pleased and honored to welcome our very special guest to today's webinar, Welcome, Dr. Balms, and I'll now hand over to you. Thank you, Julia. Um, it's a pleasure to be speaking to the audience today uh, about a topic that's near and dear to me. Uh, I don't know how many of you have encountered beryllium exposed workers, um, but it's mostly uh, beryllium exposed workers that I see in my clinical uh my clinic at Zuckerberg San Francisco General, and I've been following a cohort of uh, beryllium exposed workers, uh, primarily from Department of Energy sources uh, facilities since uh, around 2000. But I first got involved with uh, uh, diagnosis of chronic beryllium disease when I was a pulmonary uh, fellow uh, at Yale many years ago. So we're going to focus on non-malignant beryllium uh, sensitization and disease today. Uh, many of you may know that beryllium is a lung carcinogen, but I'm not talking about uh, that topic today because it's a bit different than the focus uh, of non-malignant beryllium disease. So what is beryllium? It's a strong metal, though very light, uh, it's actually the lightest of all the solid and chemically stable substances, and it has remarkable properties. It has good electrical conductivity. It's a neutron quencher. What this means is that it's capable of controlling uh, nuclear reactions, and that's for nuclear power or nuclear weapons. And because it's uh, light but strong, uh, it's often used in alloys with other metals, copper, aluminum, nickel, et cetera, to add that strength um, without adding weight. So it's not a heavy metal. So the uses of beryllium, you know, the, the photo here is somebody machining uh, on beryllium, but uh, all of our electronics equipment, your cell phone, your laptop, et cetera, have um, copper wiring and there's 2% beryllium in that copper wiring that allows the copper, which is a little bit more brittle and less flexible to be able to bend as it in electronic equipment. I've already mentioned nuclear power and weapons. It's essential. It's an essential component of those nuclear products, if you will. It's used in aerospace because it's light and strong. Telecommunications, it's basically similar to electronics. Uh, and surprisingly, maybe to many of you, it used to be put in dental alloys in the U.S. It hasn't been for some time here in the U.S., but it's still elsewhere. For example, there was a, a fairly substantial uh, number of dental technicians in Israel uh, who developed beryllium sensitization and chronic beryllium disease from its use in dental amalgams there. And then for ceramics, these aren't decorative ceramics. They're, again, electronic ceramics. Um, capacitors, transistors, et cetera. So it's used widely, even if most of you haven't sort of really encountered it in your daily practice. 
So the risk of beryllium exposure, it's really primarily an inhalational risk, but there's also skin absorption, especially if there are breaks in the skin barrier. So in occupations where there's beryllium fume generated, and for those of you who are industrial hygiene savvy, uh, fume really refers to fine particulate, primarily fine particulate metals, um, like welding fume. Paint fumes is an inappropriate use of the term. Uh, so wherever there's generation of beryllium fine particulate from melting, casting, or welding, there's a risk of beryllium exposure. Uh, whenever there's dust uh, from grinding, for example, uh, and then skin absorption, especially if there are breaks in the skin barrier, cuts, for example. You can definitely get sensitized through the skin. It's been well-documented in animals and humans. So beryllium exposure, sort of writ large here. The NIOSH, when they last looked at, the, at this, and that was about 10 years ago, estimated 800,000 workers in the U.S. had current or past exposure to beryllium so that they were at risk for beryllium sensitization and chronic beryllium disease. Worldwide, we don't have a good handle, but I've already mentioned Israel. Cases have been reported from Canada, Japan, Israel, Germany, other European countries. Uh, and certainly given electronics pr product, excuse me, production in Asia, there are beryllium exposed individuals, but I have no data about China or uh, other uh, Asian countries that are producing electronics, but it would be substantial. Uh, and that same NIOSH evaluation uh, suggested that 135,000 workers may have current exposures. Uh, so there was an epidemic of beryllium disease in the 40s and 50s in New England, primarily Massachusetts and Connecticut, because beryllium was the phosphor that was used in fluorescent light bulbs. So this was a big time at uh, exposure from manufacturer of fluorescent light bulbs. It was such heavy exposure that there was an entity called acute beryllium disease, a chemical pneumonitis. Uh, chronic beryllium disease, which used to be called beryllosis, was first um, noted in 1946. So what is chronic beryllium disease? And some of you who may be older, uh, like me, learned the term beryllosis we don't use that anymore. Uh, chronic beryllium disease is better, and I'll tell you why in subsequent slides. Maybe this one. Uh, it's a interstitial lung disease that involves sensitization to the metal. We'll talk much more about that. Uh, the reason it's no longer called beryllosis is beryllosis made it sound like a pneumoconiosis, dust in the lung uh, problem like asbestos or silica or coal workers pneumoconiosis. Uh, and it really is entirely different. We actually understand the biology of chronic beryllium disease pretty well now. And so chronic beryllium disease clinically is like sarcoidosis. And you have learned that sarcoidosis is an idiopathic disease. We don't know the cause. Beryllium induced uh, interstitial lung disease is really the one known cause of sarcoidosis. So I'm gonna to move to a case. This is a real case. I still take care of this uh, patient, uh, but I'm gonna show you how he presented. Uh, in fact, I just saw him uh, in the middle of March. Uh, so when I first uh, met him around 2000, or maybe it was 2002, he was a 47 year old man who uh, had experienced excessive fatigue for several years and some dyspnea on exertion. Uh, he's a, a fisherman and he liked to climb dams like the San Pedro Dam in the Sierra foothills uh, and climbing those dams would make him winded. He hadn't missed a day of work due to um, his symptoms though. He denied any other respiratory history other than he did state that he was treated for pneumonia several years ago with an oral antibiotic, but no chest x-ray was taken at that time. Lifelong non-smoker, no history of asthma or allergies. Now, what kind of work does he do? So he told me he's a truck driver. 
Well, that doesn't sound like he should have beryllium exposure. What product does the company make or what service does it provide? The company recycles old computers. That's a clue. What are environmental conditions at the workplace like? Dusty. So what kind of home does he live in? Just to be complete about occupational environmental history. He's very proud that uh, he's been able to save to buy a new home uh, in the Gilroy area with air conditioning, uh, forest air heating from gas furnace and electric range, fireplace with natural gas, carpets, new carpets, uh, the dog, the dog stays outside, no water damage or visible mold. It's not, is it near any major roadways or industrial facilities? No. Any secondhand smoke exposure? No. Hobbies, only fishing. So when I saw him, his physical examination reveals no abnormalities. And his pulmonary function test only show a decreased diffusing capacity for carbon monoxide. In normal spirometry, normal lung volumes. So because of uh, decreased diffusing capacity, uh, uh, high resolution, resolution CT scan of the chest was obtained, which showed nodules, thick septal lines, patchy ground glass opacification. The radiologist thought it was sarcoidosis, good possibility. He went on to fiber optic bronchoscopy with transbronchial biopsies, transbronchial. So uh, there's a risk for pneumothorax, um, but still a fairly non-invasive, it's invasive, but not heavily invasive way to obtain lung tissue. It doesn't work for all interstitial lung diseases where you need more tissues, but it can diagnose sarcoidosis pretty well uh, because all you have to do is find non-casein granulomas on those small biopsies. And that was the, here's the HRCT. It doesn't probably display as well as it might. There's areas of consolidation and ground glass, but I think you, if you squint, you'll see nodules. Um, and those nodules are all along septal lines. This is consistent with uh, sarcoidosis. Hypersensitive pneumonitis would be another possible diagnosis here. And here's a lung biopsy, and it shows a non casein granuloma. Classic for sarcoidosis. So why did I see this patient? Uh, he was actually referred by a former, uh, well, I was referred by, uh, excuse me, I was mixing up cases. He was referred by National Jewish Medical Center where the uh, initial examination and uh, pulmonary function testing and HRCT and biopsy were obtained. Uh, National Jewish Medical Center is the premier uh, referral center for beryllium, diagnosis of beryllium disease in the US. And because the gentleman um, is from the San Jose area, uh, he was referred to me. But how did they find out? How did he even, um, how, why was beryllium disease even uh, expected, suspected? It's because the, the wife surfs the web and finds out that the exposure to the metal beryllium can cause a lung condition virtually identical to sarcoidosis. And she asked her husband if he works around beryllium, and he says yes. I actually misspoke. Uh, his initial workup was in the San Jose area at Kaiser, uh, and then he was referred to National Jewish uh, for the final diagnosis, and then referred back to me for treatment. Anyway, she surps the web, finds out that beryllium can cause sarcoidosis, and her husband says that he was exposed to beryllium. How? When he was first hired by this electronics recycling uh, company, he worked the furnace. What this company did was they buy up old computers. Uh, actually, I think they got a lot of them for free. Uh, you know, when you buy a Dell computer, for example, Dell uh, will take back your old computer when you buy a new one. Uh, he would be the truck driver that would pick up those uh, old computers. Uh, but when he was first hired, he worked the furnace. This company would smash up the uh, computers to get the motherboards where the precious metals are, uh, uh, separate the motherboard from the plastic 
casing and then they would throw the motherboards into a furnace, that melt them down to get a little bit of platinum, which is in everybody's uh, electronics equipment. Uh, and the beryllium was just uh, a byproduct. So what should be done when the patient relates this information at a follow-up visit? Exactly what uh, the uh, initial diagnosing physician did. They referred the patient to National Jewish, uh, where there was expertise about beryllium disease, and they obtained uh, a peripheral blood lymphocyte proliferation test, which is the uh, definitive way to assess an abnormal immune response to beryllium, which is uh, the sine qua non of beryllium sensitization. So the diagnosis of chronic beryllium disease what we used to call beryliosis, requires evidence of a beryllium-specific immune response and sarcoid-like histology, which this gentleman had with his positive beryllium lymphocyte proliferation test and his positive biopsy. So what is this beryllium lymphocyte proliferation test? As I've said, it's evidence of a specific cell-mediated immune response to beryllium. It's delayed hypersensitivity. Uh, it's the same inflammatory uh, response as with a PPD uh, for for uh, diagnosis of latent tuberculosis. It's an in vitro proliferative response of lymphocytes, peripheral blood, or those from bronchovelar lavage to beryllium salts. And the proliferation is measured by uptake of radio labeled thymidine by lymphocytes. So patients' lymphocytes, either from blood or BAL, are cultured in the presence of uh, a medium that has radio labeled thymidine and then beryllium salts. And then there's a stimulation index, thymidine uptake of beryllium stimulated cells, stimulated by co-culture with beryllium salts versus those that just sit in the dish without any beryllium. Now it's a bioassay. Uh, and because it's a bioassay, it's kind of variable. And so there's always positive controls and the positive controls uh, are typically um, either a mitogen or candida or both, because everybody has, uh, almost everybody has delayed hypersensitization to, hypersensitivity to candida. So here is the data from the first, uh, one of the first uh, studies to um, show the usefulness of this beryllium lymphocyte proliferation test. This was a study from Penn, uh, and on the, a y-axis, we have the stimulation index, which I just described to you. And we have four different sets of uh, histograms on the x-axis. Chronic beryllium disease, both blood and lavage, show a high stimulation index. Uh, and beryllium-sensitized individuals show it in the blood, but not in the lavage. So this is beryllium-sensitized without lung disease. Beryllium exposed with other lung disease uh, there's really not much of a uh, increase in stimulation index. And then non-exposed sarcoidosis and hypersensitivity pneumonitis as a control population. Uh, again, not much in the way of uh, elevated stimulation index. Each lab that does this across the country, and there are only a few, Penn still does it, uh, the Cleveland Clinic, uh, National Jewish, uh, of the three that I know for sure that are still doing it, they all have different cutoffs. Uh, oh, yes, also um, O-Rise, uh, Oak Ridge uh, Laboratories. Uh, they all have different cutoffs, and but in general, it's two to three-fold, uh, greater than a two or three-fold uh, increased stimulation index. So a major teaching point here, Workaround metals should stimulate an investigation for beryllium sensitivity and chronic beryllium disease in a patient with possible interstitial lung disease like our patient. And especially any patient with sarcoidosis, you should take an occupational history. And if there is metal exposure, you should uh, definitely think about getting a beryllium lymphocyte proliferation test, but really, uh, almost any case of sarcoidosis, it should be considered. 
So let's talk about what we know about chronic beryllium disease pathogenesis, because we actually do know a lot. So I've already said it's a, we know it's a cell mediated immune response. Now beryllium is a light um, element uh, and it's not a complete antigen on, on its own. You don't develop antibodies to beryllium. It has, to, and you don't develop uh, cell mediated sensitization to beryllium alone. It has to be on a carrier protein. Um, and so it has to be presented by lymph two lymphocytes by uh, macrophages, uh, antigen presenting cells. Uh, and that results in, in uh, proliferation of beryllium specific uh, CD4 positive helper T cells. And then those activated T cells release cytokines that lead to granuloma formation. And here's a cartoon of this. So there's an antigen presenting cell. They're usually alveolar macrophages. There are other cells that can present uh, antigen like Langerhan cells in the skin, uh, dendritic cells also. Uh, and uh, the presentation is via uh, class two major histocompatibility complex uh, proteins. And the T cell receptor is the vehicle for uh, sensitization of naive uh, helper T cells. And once they're sensitized uh, and activated, they can lead to development of granulomas. Now, there's a genetic risk factor that has uh, helped our understanding of this pathogenesis. Uh, there's a glutamic acid substitution, a single SNP in position 69 of the beta chain of the major histocompatibility complex two molecule, HLA-DP. Uh, HLA-DP-B1 alleles are necessary for beryllium-induced T-cell responses. Uh, and the main one that uh, has been studied is HLA-DP-B1. There are some other uh, molecules as well. But this GLU-69 SNP is right in the groove for antigen presentation of the, and I'll show you that. Uh, so here's just a cartoon of an antigen presenting cell with the HLA DP uh, beta one major histo histocompatibility complex protein uh, linking with uh, the uh, antigen receptor on a helper T cell. This is the cartoon of how this happens. Uh, and with this um, model of the HLA-DP molecule, there's a position 69 uh, right in the groove for uh, antigen peptide presentation. This particular cartoon shows the, immuno, the influenza hemagglutinin peptide, which is since flu season is still a bit upon us. Um, this is relevant to our uh, clinical experience, but the reason they used something like uh, an influenza antigen is that we don't know the protein or proteins that beryllium um, attaches to that um, is involved in this pathway. We understand the signaling pathway, except for we don't know which proteins. You know, people have thought that it might be iron containing pro uh, iron carrying proteins like transferrin, um, but that hasn't been clearly documented. And position 55 and position 56 are alternative uh, variants of HLA-DP molecule that have been associated with uh, risk of chronic beryllium disease. Now, this slide is to show how strong the effect is. And uh, if you're GLU69 positive, which is the uh, variant uh, uh, allele, uh, you have a 30-fold a increased risk of chronic building disease compared to somebody without that who's also exposed. That's what this uh, two by two table is showing. And I, I, sh I show the raw two by two table from one study. Uh, this was a NIOSH study in 1999, just to show how powerful the effect is.
to the point that this led to controversy. Um, it's such a strong risk factor that um, the major uh, manufacturer of beryllium containing products in the US, I, I think it's actually the only one at, at the time was Brush Wellman. They were proposing to do genetic screening of workers um, and exclude workers with GLU-69 positive from beryllium exposure jobs. They actually, there was pushback about that. Uh, they do still offer that screening, um, but they don't, they try to talk people out of beryllium ex exposure jobs, but they, they, they actually don't use the genetic uh, test exclusively. Uh, that's not entirely, uh, it's not entirely clear if that's legal at this point. So let's talk about progression from beryllium sensitization to chronic beryllium disease, because there's only a small portion of sensitized individuals that end up with lung disease. So of exposed workers, it's usually uh, just single digit percentages, except in some heavily exposed groups like machinists, it's been as high as 16%, but I've never seen higher than that. So most people who are exposed to beryllium don't develop sensitization. And it's a feeling is that you need this genetic predisposition uh, to become sensitized. Now, once you develop sensitization, the, the, the older thinking was that the progression to chronic beryllium disease was fairly impressive, 40 to 80%. But the reason I have this in red with question marks, there's new data to suggest otherwise, because the high rate of progression was based on the experience of more heavily exposed folks from several decades ago or more. And we now, uh, because we're screening for beryllium sensitization at a much wider, in a much wider population, we're finding that the rate of progression is also less. When we were just screening heavily exposed groups like machinists, a lot of people progressed. It's less clear that less heavily exposed people progress at that same rate. The latency from exposure to actual clinical disease can be a few months to many years. And this is the way it sometimes is with uh, immune mediated diseases. And as I've already said, chronic brilliant disease presents with a clinical picture that's pretty identical to sarcoidosis. There are some differences. Uh, I don't know if I have a slide about that. Uh, let's see, I think there is one coming up. There are a little bit of differences. So clinical presentation. It's easier if there's a history of beryllium exposure, but not everybody knows that they've been exposed to beryllium. It's kind of an exotic metal. Uh, dysmion exertion is the most common presenting system, symptom. Non-productive cough and then constitutional symptoms are also fairly common. Uh, and chest auscultation may and I underscore may reveal bibasilar inspiratory crackles. But those of you that are savvy about the chest exam know that by the time you have bibasilar crackles, you also have pretty impressive disease. So somebody who just has um, a few granulomas from chronic you know, evidence of chronic brilliant disease will probably not have crackles. It's only when you start to have interstitial fibrosis that you'll hear crackles. So chest imaging studies typically show diffuse interstitial infiltrates and sometimes bilaterally enlarged hyalur lymph nodes. Now here's a difference with sarcoid. Sarcoidosis usually has enlarged hyalur lymph nodes, so-called potato nodes. It's not always the case with uh, chronic brilliant disease. Uh, like sarcoidosis, you can get obstructive uh, disease when you have a lot of airway involvement, restricted disease when it's more um, lung parenchyma or mixed. And then also like sarcoidosis, bronchovelar lavage shows increased T lymphocytes that are usually CD4 positive helper cells. We know the antigen that draws uh, a, a clonal uh, population of CD4 cells from the blood to the lungs and it's beryllium in chronic beryllium disease. It's, we don't know what that antigen is or antigens for idiopathic, so-called idiopathic sarcoidosis. The other big difference between sarcoidosis and 
chronic brilliant disease is there's much less extra pulmonary manifestations with chronic brilliant disease. Almost everything has been uh, reported with chronic brilliant disease that you see in sarcoid with the exception of uveitis and erythema nodosum. But uh, I have never seen neurologic uh, manifestations of chronic brilliant disease. I have seen liver involvement and skin involvement. Renal involvement, I have not seen, or cardiac involvement, I've not seen with chronic renal disease. It's not to say it doesn't happen, it's just not very common. Okay, the diagnosis. I've more or less given you this already, but just to uh, go over it, you need abnormal blood or BAL, beryllium lymphocyte proliferation test results. That's the beryllium sensitization piece. And histopathology in the lung consistent with... Um, sarcoidosis. When I say lung, that could be airway biopsies as well. And I'm showing you the same photo I showed before. This is actually my patient's uh, uh, transbronchial biopsy. Now, non-invasive tests, including the high-resolution CT scan, are not sufficiently sensitive. That's not to say that I haven't stopped at an HRCT uh, when I have, a, I have sensitization documented and a HRCT that the radiologist says, this is sarcoidosis slash chronic brillum disease. But I usually go on to a transbronchial biopsy with BAL in such a patient to be sure. Because often the patients I see, and I'm gonna talk about those because I've actually reported um, the first 50 uh, or so of patients that I've seen from uh, Department of Energy facilities, mostly Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, uh, people were, had normal HRCTs. So I was going on to the transbronchial biopsy because it's more sensitive. So uh, you can do BAL without biopsy. And if you found alveolitis, i.e. a lot of lymphocytes, T lymphocytes, that uh, is pretty strong evidence uh, of chronic brilliant disease. So chronic brilliant disease can progress to an advanced irreversible disease even after cessation of exposure. Uh, the gentleman that, uh, the case that I described, who's a truck driver, um, because his, his disease has progressed, he no longer can drive the truck. He's got a management position, supervisor position. Uh, he's supposedly not exposed, though I have my concerns about that. Uh, and he's progressed um, relentlessly despite uh, being on oral prednisone. Spontaneous improvement after removal from further exposure can also occur. But while that, those of you who are savvy about sarcoid know that a lot of people with sarcoid get better spontaneously. Uh, that's less true with um, brilliant disease. But removal from further exposure certainly appears to help. Earlier, milder disease may be more reversible. That's sort of common sense. And uh, patients with chronic brilliant disease should be removed from further exposure. I really wanted that, uh, my patient, the case, to leave that workplace because I thought there was still exposure to brilliant. Even if he's out driving a truck, he still comes back to the facility. Now he's in an office in that facility, but he has to walk out to uh, supervise folks in the warehouse, uh, but still, I worry about beryllium exposure. Um, and then patients with chronic beryllium disease may respond to systemic steroid therapy, but again, not as well as sarcoidosis patients. And my case was, he has been treated with prednisone, still is. I've added methotrexate a couple times, uh, and he just hasn't tolerated methotrexate, so we're stuck with prednisone. This is the brilliant disease pyramid that I like to share with people. A lot of people, I could even have another layer of, uh, of this pyramid, I should. Brilliant exposed is a big layer at the bottom. Of that big layer that I'm not showing, a small percentage gets sensitized, two to 5% if it's not a, machinist population. Of the sensitized individuals, 
some folks develop beryllium alveolitis, i.e. they have um, clonal uh, T-cell homing to the lung, uh, and that'll show up on a BAL lymphocyte uh, differential count. Some of those people with beryllium alveolitis go on to develop asymptomatic chronic beryllium disease where they'll have some granulomas. But if you just have a few granulomas without uh, much fibrosis, you won't be impaired. And so only a so small su subset go on to the full bore disease with impairment. Uh, and this is sort of the time course. It's another way of looking at this. Uh, Pyramid, exposure, sensitization, alveolitis, granuloma formation, the lung fibrosis. Now, uh, what's sort of the burden of persistent beryllium sensitization and CBD out in the real world? Uh, well, disease burden persists despite sustained efforts to reduce exposure to airborne beryllium. And I'll show you some data about this. Uh, so sensitization and chronic beryllium disease occur at facilities where exposure was lower than the former OSHA limit. We just have a new OSHA uh, standard. The two microgram per meter cubed uh, did not prevent sensitization. And that's, there's very strong evidence of that. That's why OSHA uh, promulgated a new standard. And it's actually a, a nice example of uh, a public-private uh, partnership. NIOSH, uh, when it was uh, threatened with uh, closure uh, several administrations ago uh, by a Republican Congress, uh, decided that they needed to have more uh, efforts to show value to industry. And so the Brush Wellman was, as I mentioned, uh, the major supplier of beryllium containing materials to the U.S. market. It's now called Materion, same company. And uh, they've worked closely with NIOSH and published a number of very important studies. Uh, and this one showed that uh, even in a company that was very committed to controlling exposures and kept them below the OSHA limit, as was documented by industrial hygiene monitoring, careful industrial hygiene monitoring, there were still cases of sensitization developing in this plant in Tucson, which was a modern facility, you know, with sort of state-of-the-art equipment. And uh, 15 people developed uh, brilliant sensitization, and uh, I guess half of those developed uh, chronic brilliant disease. So because there were still cases being uh, reported even at uh, very well controlled facilities, OSHA took a decade that they finally in 2017 a new per permissible exposure limit of 0 0.2 micrograms per meter cubed. So um, a uh, order of magnitude lower and it was a eight hour time weighted average like the old one was. And the, the short term exposure limit was set uh, at the old uh, eight hour time weighted average. So what does the new standard uh, require? It requires engineering and work practice control. Such as ventilation and exposure. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt uh, the webinar at this point, but something's happened to your sound, John, and I, I wondered if moved uh, I haven't done mic. a thing, so. Uh, oh, you're back again now. So I don't know. You just disappeared completely at this slide. Maybe start again. Okay. So I was saying that there's a new OSHA standard promulgated in 2017 after multiple decades of effort uh, because the old standard uh, was not protecting people from sensitization. So the new standard is an order of magnitude lower. Uh, 0.2 micrograms per meter cubed. And the old time-weighted average eight-hour standard uh, is now the short-term exposure limit. And the feeling is this uh, will better protect workers from developing sensitization. The standard also requires engineering and work practice controls, such as ventilation or enclosure. It requires an exposure control plan 
and training of workers on beryllium hazards. I don't mention respiratory protection. That's in there if, uh, if necessary, but it's not uh, felt to be particularly appropriate for a sensitization risk. And it requires uh, medical surveillance. With uh, medical removal protection benefits to workers if they have a beryllium related disease. So this is similar to uh, what occurs for lead. So let's talk about medical surveillance for chronic beryllium disease because that is actually now required by OSHA. It, incur it currently involves annual blood uh, beryllium lymphocyte proliferation testing. If positive, the test is repeated uh, because it's a bioassay, as I mentioned, and there's variability. So you can have false negatives and false positives. The old approach is two positive beryllium lymphocyte proliferation tests, then moving on to transbronchial biopsies, as I've mentioned. Um, there are data to support one positive and one borderline. Uh, I don't have time to go into the details of what's a borderline positive beryllium lymphocyte proliferation test, but um, one strongly positive and two and one borderline will work. And some people even think two borderline. Uh, and older studies showed virtually all workers with chronic beryllium disease to have impairment. But as I said, this is no longer really the case. And so the goal is primary prevention of chronic beryllium disease and secondary prevention of impairment. And these are data from National Jewish, um, which actually caused uh, the Department of Energy, which is a major uh, source of beryllium exposure in the workplace, to uh, develop a screening program for beryllium sensitization. Uh, so the bottom line here is that this national Jewish data from a few decades ago showed a high rate of sensitization uh, in these populations that they studied. But again, these were he more heavily exposed populations before we did such widespread screening. And they also showed that, this is the same study, uh, this uh, Kaplan-Meier plot just shows that, you know, by uh, 10 years, almost everybody with sensitization developed chronic beryllium disease. Again, this is sort of old data that doesn't currently apply. Uh, this slide though probably is still true. And this is just showing latency, which can be many years. So just because somebody hasn't been exposed for, to beryllium for 20 years doesn't mean their previous exposure will uh, cause them to develop chronic beryllium disease. So now I'm gonna show you, uh, you know, a couple studies that have come out in the last uh, decade or so. And this was a study uh, from National Jewish so these were mostly folks from the Rocky Flats uh, nuclear weapons production facility um, that isn't too far from Denver. And so these were heavily exposed folks. And uh, 17 of these 55 individuals who had beryllium sensitization from screening went on to develop chronic beryllium, beryllium disease. Um, now they didn't all develop severe disease that some of these uh, individuals had just biopsy documented granulomas without impairment. Um, and there was no difference in age, sex, race, ethnicity, smoking, or beryllium exposure time. And machinists were more likely to progress from beryllium sensitization to chronic beryllium disease. So there seems to be, you know, an exposure, uh, probably an exposure gene, exposure genetic risk uh, interaction. They did. They they published another study uh, of a larger sample of workers. So they were folks um, from other places aside from Rocky Flats. This time they had 251 folks, uh, and nine percent developed uh, beryllium sensitization. Uh, nine of these people with beryllium sensitization, all 251 had sensitization. Excuse me. Nine percent developed chronic beryllium disease, and of those. Uh, I don't think that's supposed to be uh, 171. I think that's the wrong number there. But 19% of their chronic beryllium disease cases uh, um, went on to require oral immunosuppressive therapy. So the point here is that most individuals uh, who develop chronic beryllium disease 
don't get really sick. We only give the oral prednisone or methotrexate or other drugs to those that are uh, have developed an impairment. And again, machinists had faster progression. Now, I mentioned NIOSH has worked closely with Brush Wellman. So they did a, a, a study of 136 uh, beryllium ceramics workers, uh, and, and they followed uh, people who left employment. And their uh, prevalence uh, in 1992, uh, beryllium sensitization was 6% and 4% chronic beryllium disease. And when they followed people up, uh, those not sensitized in 1992, um, there were, were Additional cases of brilliant sensitization and brilliant disease for cumulative incidence of 15% and 11%. And this was uh, a facility that followed the old OSHA uh, permissible exposure limit of um, two micrograms per meter cubed. So another study of brush melman workers that NIOSH uh, collaborated with, uh, no, actually NIOSH didn't collaborate with this one. Uh, they followed current and former employees um, with sensitization and most did not develop chronic brilliant disease, uh, only a small percentage, um, 11 to 17% about. So many workers in the Department of Energy nuclear weapons production facilities were exposed to brilliant during the Cold War. And because it was a uh, sort of national security priority, uh, OSHA really didn't go into these facilities and there was no real attempt to control beryllium exposure. There was, so there's a legacy of, of uh, beryllium exposed cold warriors on the home front. Uh, the Department of Energy started a screening program with peripheral blood uh, beryllium lymphocyte proliferation testing in response to this. Um, and then Workers with two positive beryllium lymphocyte proliferation tests undergo workup for chronic beryllium disease, including bronchoscopy. They're referred to local physicians. I'm the person in Northern California that gets most of these cases, uh, but there are other folks in other parts of the uh, country. And it says recently, this is an old slide, uh, Congress did pass a bill providing $150,000 compensation to former workers with chronic beryllium disease. It's the Energy Employees Occupational Illness Compensation uh, program act. Um, and you can also get, uh, $150,000 for uh, silicosis and for, um, various cancers. I only see the chronic brilliant disease, uh, folks. Um, so what are, is my experience? I, I've now seen over about 120, uh, department of energy, uh, workers with brilliant sensitization. I published with Jim Seward, who many of you know, uh, our experience with the first 50 uh, of those workers. So this was a number of years ago. And the mean duration of employment was 18 years. Mean latency from first possible exposure was 32 years. Uh, but there, you know, that's a little bit uh, of a funny number because there wasn't any screening for them until the Department of Energy decided to do that. So five of these 50 had chronic brilliant disease at the time of evaluation. Uh, and three others had evidence of probable CBD. Here's the flow chart uh, or the flow diagram. Uh, 18, 1875 workers at Lawrence Livermore were tested for sensitization. 59 had sensitization. Uh, and I got to see 50 of those 59. And just to see what kind of jobs they had and how, what kind of exposure they might have had. We divided them up to low, moderate, high exposure in consultation with an industrial hygienist there. And you, know, you can see the machinists at the top. And here on the far right is our 3% uh, sensitization, 0.3% uh, uh, beryllium disease. Uh, out of the 1875, as compared to Rocky Flats from National Jewish, and then um, a consortium of folks at other DOE facilities. And, you know, the ballpark is, is sort of similar. The reason that uh, Rocky Flats is probably higher uh, in terms of chronic brilliant disease is that it, the exposure was he heavier. And I show that here. 
uh, on this slide, on the bottom in purple uh, diamonds is the concentrations of beryllium measured at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory compared to Rocky Flats over a similar time frame, 19, early 1960s to uh, around 1990. So uh, I have just a couple more slides. Uh, this is this slide, I won't go into detail, but this slide shows that um, if you, this is a brush moment facility, again, was done in collaboration with NIOSH. When they went above and beyond sort of a usual uh, control plan, they were able to uh, reduce the uh, percentage of folks uh, going on to develop beryllium sensitization. So there's an important study that showed that uh, interventions to reduce exposure can be a benefit. So I'll just summarize by saying uh, pathogenesis of chronic beryllium disease involves a beryllium specific cell mediated immune response. Medical surveillance can be done for beryllium sensitization using this blood test. Diagnosis of chronic beryllium disease in somebody who's sensitized usually involves invasive testing, not always. The published literature suggests that there is a high rate of progression from beryllium sensitization to chronic beryllium disease over time, but there are some more recent studies which uh, suggest this may not be true anymore because exposures are much less. Uh, the old literature supported recommendations for an aggressive approach to the diagnosis and staging of chronic beryllium disease in persons with beryllium sensitization. What I currently do is a little bit less aggressive. I offer bronchoscopy to everybody that I see. But uh, if people are uh, reluctant to have bronchoscopy, because uh, it is, you know, somewhat invasive, uh, I am willing to do annual follow-up clinical exam and, and lung function tests. And then if people progress um, either by symptoms or lung function testing, I move on to HRCT and possible uh, bronchoscopy. And with that, I'll thank you and, and stop for questions. Thank you so much for that presentation. And please, um, we do have some time. So if you'd like to enter questions into the QA or chat section for Dr. Barnes, we have one question, which is, do you or someone in your practice ever go out to the workplace to observe or measure exposures? Uh, I do not go out to the workplace to measure exposures, though I, I have... Uh, been fortunate to work with industrial hygienists over the years that can do that. Um, the workplace that I most have see uh, sensitized uh, workers from is Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. I have gone out there and given talks, <laughs> but I actually haven't been able to see the workplace. I think that um, probably requires uh, a more thorough security uh, clearance than I have tried to obtain. Um, I will say that that study that I mentioned that was in collaboration with Jim Seward, he was the head of uh, employee health services at Lawrence Livermore. And one of our uh, then occupational environmental medicine residents at UCSF did work with Jim and, and did help me uh, compile the data. And he did get the chance to observe um, workplaces where there's beryllium exposure Lawrence Livermore has done a tremendous job at, re at working to reduce exposures. Uh, but in one of the buildings where they did uh, try to clean up uh, where beryllium had been machined, one thing that was problematic is that they didn't, they forgot about the rafters of that building. And so some of the construction workers that were putting in new sheet, new, um, uh, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, ducting actually got exposed to dust that was up in the rafters. And um, I've seen two cases of sensitization from in, in those uh, contract workers that came in to do the, the, some of the construction work. So even in a place that's really trying to do the right thing, there can be inadvertent exposures. Uh, a couple of people are asking if uh, we have permission to share copies of your slides, and usually we will send 
If it's OK yes. with you, we'll send a PDF of the slides along with the link to the YouTube channel where you'll be able to see the video recording and share with your colleagues as well, if you like. So thank you. Um, somebody has asked, um, not sure what happens in Silicon Valley, but do you see higher numbers in the Bay Area? Well, the most of the Bay Area uh, patients that I've seen have been referred through Department of Energy facilities. So they're either people that work at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory or Sandia Labs, which is you know adjacent, or I've seen a couple from Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Uh, and then the one gentleman from the electronics recycling facility, which is down in San Jose. Uh, I also saw somebody from a Lockheed facility. He was a uh, engineer um, working on uh, ceramics uh, for electronics purposes. Um, I also saw somebody who worked at a facility that was making mirrors that contained beryllium for um, uh, high tech uh, aerospace applications. When I was in LA, I saw some folks from aerospace companies. And when I was in New Haven during my fellowship, um, the facility that we, we actually reported an outbreak of five cases in a facility, it was the same kind of facility as my gentleman from San Jose. It was a electronics recycling facility. Um, one person says that prior guidance for surveillance, surveillance was every three years. But do you in, advise yes. that? Sorry. I, Sorry, no, I, every three years is what I do for someone that I've done bronchoscopy on. Uh, and, and they were negative for chronic growing disease. Then I say, come back every three years. Somebody who um, has chronic growing disease, I like them to come back every year so I can see if they're progressing uh, and might need oral immunosuppressive therapy. In somebody who um, I have who sensitized, but I haven't done bronchoscopy on, I have them come back every year because um, I don't want to miss chronic brilliant disease. So individuals that I know have sensitization but are negative for chronic brilliant disease, including you know negative on bronchoscopy, I have them come back every three years. Um, I think um, now we pretty much run out of our time for questions, although we had two or three more. Do you have time for a couple more, Dr. Barnes? Or we... I, I, I do. I'm going to open my door, though, because I have a meeting scheduled, so I'll see if people can, are coming in. I'll be right back. Thanks, everyone, for your patience and understanding and all your good questions. I glad that we can ask a couple more of them. So I'm back. I, I can give okay. another minute or two. So w one person asks, is the medical exam to workers working with beryllium required or optional? Uh, that's a good question. You know, I, I should know what the OSHA regulation uh, requires. I'm not sure that it requires an actual uh, physical exam. I'm going to have to look that up. Um, it should be easy to, if you just Googled um, the OSHA, the new OSHA standard, it'll probably tell you. I mean, you can uh, get to that. Another question is, um, can you be exposed through the eyes and is wearing goggles required when working with beryllium? That's another good question. I don't know any specific studies about that, though there might be, but because, because you can be exposed um, through the skin, I would say that uh, probably you could be exposed through the eyes and that I, I, I do, I would recommend wearing goggles. Um, have, you, to a mask. have you ever seen any cases of sensitization associated with dentist technicians? Making, yes. yes. Yes, I have. It's been reported in the, li in the literature from, uh, come on in, I'm going to be getting off here. My meeting is about to start. Okay. Uh, well, thank uh, you. But I just would say, I'll finish that. The, it's been reported from Israel and I've actually seen one case uh, in uh Somebody uh, lived in Marin who did dental technician work in his basement as a second job in terrible conditions in terms of exposure. And he developed a very bad chronic brilliant disease. 
Well, thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Barnes. It was an excellent presentation. Okay, bye bye. Hello. Hi, uh, uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, we have next month um, on May 2nd, we have Dr. Meg Schwartzman who is presenting on green chemicals and the chemical policy. And we also have upcoming in-person courses, including on April 19th, a course on um, silica and health, which will be in downtown Oakland. And we also have on May 4th and 5th, a two-day CREH symposium, which marks four decades of the Center for Occupational and Environmental Health in California, and that will be in Sacramento at the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing. So please take a look at our website for all of our upcoming courses, and thanks for joining us today. <laughs>